Thank you. Um, so I hope you won't be disappointed. I'm going to read some things. Um, but, you know, when you take on a project such as I have here, it's, it's pretty hybrid. And so I think it's uh, important that I, I show you some of the ways that I've been thinking about the work that you're seeing here. So um, I will try and leave enough time, though, to talk more specifically about my own work. But I consider all of this in the truest sense, at least this combination of things, my own work. So uh, my talk today is called Bri Brilliant Barterables or Just Junk Bonds, Trading Around Durer, Hogarth and Me. So the roadmap you need is that basically I'm going to be talking a little bit about first the enterprise of working in this way, then talking a little bit about engraving, and a little bit about currency or money, and then I'll be talking a little more specifically about the Hogarth and Durer prints that I was looking at, and then ultimately about the project that I came up with as an individual artist. So I'm going to start um, with just a brief reading from a, a text a book called, uh, by Mark Hallett on Hogarth. And this is the very beginning of the book. In the spring of 1720, at the age of 22, William Hogarth made a subdued but eloquent entry into the world of printmaking. Sometime in April of that year, he issued a small trade card, which formally signaled his decision to set up shop as a professional copper plate engraver. And it actually shows us the picture of the trade card. I'm not sure if they have it here in the collection. Despite its modest dimensions and restricted content, this piece of commercial paraphernalia provides a powerful indication of Hogarth's skills and aspirations right at the beginning of his career. On the card, Hogarth's name and profession are inscribed with a calligraphic flourish that flaunts his ability as a penman, an accomplished engraver of elegant lettering. Meanwhile, the figures symbolizing art and history on either side and the floating putti above, one of whom carries a drawing signifying artistic invention, demonstrate his proficiency in depicting the human figure, uh, his knowledge of the pictorial language of allegory, and his willingness to engage with the most elevated subjects and themes. Finally, it's worth noting the elaborate gilded frame, the heavy swags, the sculptural portrait bust, and the swirling extravagant cartouche that lies at the base of the image, all of which confirm Hogarth's ability to assemble and maneuver a range of decorative forms drawn from classical and continental precedents. It is clear, therefore, that even the card's tiniest details were designed to show off the young artist's versatility and sophistication and to announce a new and ambitious pre presence in the field of English engraving. So I wanted to begin my talk with that little um, introduction because in a certain sense it's about uh, Hogarth setting up shop as a kind of multitasker. And I thought it'd be a good way to, for me to talk a little bit about m my setting up shop as an artist curator. So first of all, what is an artist curator? Well, I'm not sure. Um, but I was asked by Ihor Holobitsky, who's here today, thank you very much, Ihor, um, if I would like to poke around in the collection and develop a project. And in a certain sense, I think that asking somebody to do something like this really bespeaks one of the kind of interesting but maybe even problematic aspects of our culture of art, art making and artistic practice. And that is that we often are so kind of addicted to our notion of specialization that certain people look and think and interpret and other people are inspired and make and they display that in some sense, we, um, we, we come up against a bit of a problem if we start thinking about an artist taking up the activity that we often associate with the museum professional. So I was really happy to do that. And in fact, one of the things that I really like to sort of wrestle with or think about is the idea that instead of being uh, a specialist artist or even a contemporary artist, I like to think of myself as an artist citizen. So, I'm as interested as the rest of the public, which I hope they are, in what the museums hold and what they have to tell us. And one of the things that I'll quickly tell you about that brought this to mind for me a few years ago when I was working on the project Art and Cold Cash with Jack Butler, who's here, and Sheila Butler, and William Noah, and Ruby Arnaknak, as well as other artists in Baker Lake. We staged a conversation where we were talking about our project. And at one point, um, I think I asked William Noah, about his father, Luke Anuhadluk, who was an important Inuit artist. 
And I said, well, how did people, or how was it that, that he was recognized as being an important artist, or how did people know, other than to look at the works he made? And William said, well, he was a great hunter, and he was a great leader in the community, therefore he was a great artist. So it struck me that William's analysis was much more about the idea of the artist as a citizen and not so much a marginal specialist who does one thing and other people in the community do other things, but that an artist could be a player amidst a number of the kinds of things that go on in the community or we could say amidst the number of things that go on in the art world. So that's my, in a sense, that was a bit of an inspiration for me around this idea that to not claim the need to be the sort of specialist savant as an artist and let somebody else always do the talking to say what it is I'm doing or what I'm thinking about <coughs> seemed like a viable way to proceed. Um, so the, the other thing I, I guess you could say is that this exhibition in essence then represents a kind of a manifesto for me and that is that you know, I took on the role of the student, the researcher, the connoisseur, the creator, the neophyte, the expert, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I really like to work like that, and it, it certainly has, this, this whole project has been a kind of inspiration and an education for me. I also want to say something about the process of developing the exhibition. Um, first of all, of course, I began digging around. I mean, I was really given, in a certain sense, carte blanche to look at whatever I wanted to look at. And I think for me, it was a credit to the museum that I, in as much as I was interested in prints, um, I really began with a very sort of open uh, field and thought that I might work in, in several different directions, and I can talk about that a little bit. And it was a great credit to Ihor and to the museum that as an artist or a creative person or a thinker, I was able to actually digress, change my mind, ask to look at something and then not be interested in it, ask to put a whole lot of things on a list and then not use that list. Um, it wasn't totally without any order, um, but at the same time, I think as anybody who knows, uh, who works with creative activities, digression, contradiction, all these things are really important and sometimes institutions don't really make that possible but this one certainly did. So eventually I came up with um, this kind of trajectory that moves from Durer to Hogarth to critical shipwrecks to stowaways. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit about why that is and I'm going to, throughout the talk I'm going to read a little bit from things that I've written. So this was my original proposal and it made its way into, um, into some of the writing that I did. So many of the works in the collection at McMaster inform our understanding of a trajectory regarding the critical and ethical minded role of art over an extended historical period. Specifically, many graphic works demonstrate the conscious engagements of artists in such strategies as negative commentary, parody, and other modes of critique. So the vast collection of etchings by Hogarth, for example, includes significant examples of trenchant and often humorous visual commentary. More recent prints also stay at the critical course while operating in a less direct fashion, and for example, Picasso's Dream and Lie of Franco and Leon Golub's Wasted Youth employ a rhetoric engaging more subtle ironies. So this is part of my proposal. As an artist, I'm interested in my role as a social critic and also fascinated at the idea of the artist as a suspicious fool or, or foolish figure in culture. In this regard, both Sebastian Brandt's notion of a ship of fools as represented the, through the Durer prints, on which no social being could avoid potential inclusion, and the idea of the suspect character of the artist rhetorician are rich sites of consideration for me. So in context of a culture where the relationship between aesthetics and critique is often misunderstood and undervalued, and art's function as a commodity could be said to often undermine its capacity for truth-telling, I conceive of artists as significant passengers on the ship of fools. My own work normally involves graphic practice, often hybridized materially and spatially, and generally engages with contemporary critical commentary. So my aesthetic influences include historical arts and crafts and works of contemporary artists whose leanings are graphically and socially oriented, and I suggested Sigmar Polka, for example, and my artist colleagues and peers. The majority of these latter artists, my colleagues and peers, are not normally engaged in overt visual critiques, 
but I observe each as having integrated a critical point of view uh, within which his or her within his or her work while upholding the capacity of aesthetics to simultaneously challenge, elicit wonder, propose transformation, among other things. So the project, and I thought at the time I was going to call the project after one of the Dürer prints, and that is of taking offense at but learning from fools involves the presentation of an exhibition entitled Shipwreck, that was the earlier title for the exhibition, now it's called Voyager, um, which will include works from the collection of McMaster, a display of small stowaway objects or artifacts by artists, and the work of um, Dürer and Hogarth. And so as I move through this little discussion, I will eventually talk a bit about my own practice and ev eventually also more specifically about the Dürers and Hogarths. But I want to first, before doing that, um, talk about what I think of as the sort of critical or material structure of the print. And I'm speaking really specifically of, um, of engraving. Excuse me. So, as a print media artist, I'm especially interested in the idea of the network of engraved lines um, that becomes a kind of visual language a carrier of meaning and a marker or even a metonym of value and I'll say a little bit what I mean about that and indeed I've long been engaged with the language of engraving and have considered it to advance a graphic syntax that we actually uphold in popular forms even today and what do I mean by that think of your um, your glove box stuffed with Canadian tire money and the kind of engraved look of that cheap paper that they give you so readily at Canadian Tire and you know that that language of of the engraved line carries a certain kind of authority. Um, regarding its popular usage my interest in engraving was previously focused on paper money currency specifically regarding Canadian currency and identity. So within the book that I held up earlier Art and Cold Cash um, I observed something about Canadian paper money and I realize this is a bit of a digression but it'll give you a bit of a sense of where some of this thinking about about engraving and this kind of authority it carries comes from. So I wrote this in an article entitled Forging a National Currency Emily Gilbert notes that at the time of her writing in the late 20th century there was an increase of interest in the subject of national currencies as monetary transformations were occurring and as certain national currencies were being threatened. According to Gilbert, when borders between monetary systems shift or are removed altogether and as paper money comes to be displaced by virtual forms of exchange, the cultural status of currency becomes a deeply significant topic of critical consideration. So she's talking about the, the sort of iconographic value of what we represent on our money and how we, for, for some reason, invest so, continue to invest so heavily in that form of representation. In general terms, it can be said that the use of national currencies is an invented tradition within which nationalist iconographies can be disseminated at the same time as potential monetary stability and state sovereignty are promoted. Through the exchange of state-generated currency, the nation becomes visible, in, uh, visibly involved in daily trade against a backdrop whereby the community defines itself. So through increasingly inexpensive and ready methods of print production, national currencies also gain the potential to distribute nationalizing iconographies with increasing attention to historical nuance. In Canada, for example, we have been watching Queen Elizabeth age gradually based on comparatively regular updates to her portrait on the front of our $20 bill. And today, as we know, that portrait is disseminated on plastic and yet it still looks as if it were drawn with an engraver's needle. Um, and here I go on just a little further. So the idea of a national currency in Canada was introduced in 1840 but was not fully realized until 1954. Emily Gilbert suggests that this seeming late arrival of national paper money was in part due to the lasting ties between Canada and Britain, which sounds obvious, as well as our proximity to the United States. Additionally, the Bank of Canada was only formed in 1934, and so it was after that time that the necessary ties between the state, financial institutions, and mechanisms of monetary control existed to eventually allow for a Canadian paper currency to be released. And that's the end of the excerpt I'm reading, reading in that regard. In terms of my, early, we could say my earlier interest in, in money as a kind of image. 
I hope with this I'm lodging within my little conversation that the visual language of engraving has a kind of authority and in popular par parlance helps produce a type of affect that inflects our experience of things engraved, money, old prints, and newer works of art with a sense of gravitas or its opposite. So I think in, in a sense the works by Hogarth certainly kind of carry with them a sense of, of a kind of um, tradition and import through the very language of the image itself. Now I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about the notion of artwork itself as a form of currency. And here I go back a little bit to the Art and Cold Cash project again. Um, so in part the project, Art and Cold Cash, encouraged me to ponder the notion of art itself as a form of currency or a medium of exchange such that I exper experimented with thinking about the exchange system that includes art and about ways to draw attention to it. And so here I'm going to refer briefly to something, something else that I wrote. Um, among the numerous artistic and social gestures inherent to the Art and Cold Cash project, various instances of trading and bartering took place. Most noteworthy among those activities was the exchange of photographs that were originally made by Jack Butler in the early 1970s and the trade of other items as we showed in a video that we made. It was called Recarding, Recalling the Barter Economy, Trading the Past and the Present. Of the exchanges we presented in the video, a trade for one of my drawings of a seal bone made in the 1980s when I lived in the North um, and then brought to Baker Lake in 2004 was significant. And you'll just bear with me for a little bit while I explain what's going on. So there was this modest action that I considered to be germane to my interest in the idea of, of being an artist as a kind of a trader. So to be specific about the occurrence, during our trading project, a hunter named Silas Autuk, um, Aitauk, sorry, um, uh, uh, Inuit hunter who's since died, took an interest in a series of drawings I brought to the north at the start of our project. And I really only brought them as a means of introducing myself as an artist to the Baker Lake community. And so it hadn't been my intention to trade the drawings, but I was intrigued by Silas's expressed interest in them and by his eventual explanation that if one were to feed a child the meat that was attached to one of the bones that I had drawn, um, the child would grow up to be a great hunter. I was even more engaged by the fact that after sharing his story, Silas went back to his house to retrieve a photo of his family to offer in exchange for my work. Needless to say, the exchange appeared to have the ben benchmarks of a fair trade. So if we shift the position inherent to the conventional link, in this case between Inuit and art and southern outsiders, um, we, we can think of other sort of means of, of considering this idea of art and barter or art and trade. And so I did one other little project in the north which, um, in which I tried to play this out. And that was simply that I asked people if I could take their photographs and make a drawing of them from the photographs and then I would give them the drawing and I would keep the photograph. And in this case, it was another sort of system of exchange that seemed to kind of, in some sense, play out this idea that the art itself could take on a form of, or, or take on the status of a kind of currency. So if we carry along this idea of, and I've named a couple of ideas, uh, or general areas of idea, um, the idea of engraving as a visual bearer of authority or social significance, and art as itself a kind of currency, I now want to turn back to my role here as an artist curator and make some comments about uh, the Durer and Hogarth works that I was looking at specifically. So I'd like to think of the lineage that links Durer to Hogarth and eventually to my practice as one that relies on a system of exchange or trading of one form of artistic disposition for another and another. Clearly, Sebastian Brandt, who was the writer of the, the volume called The Ship of Fools on which the Durer uh, prints were based, lived in a period where the, the role of the artist as a rhetorician was very circumscribed, such that their works were expected to be directive in the manner that would be what that we would today find absurd for an artistic expression. And then 250 years later in 1762, when we have William Hogarth making some of the significant works we see, it had become appropriate for Hogarth's works to reflect the contradictions of a society moving towards modernity. 
and to foreground the artist whose individual voice had a dawning social agency and a kind of individualism. So, and then we, if we bring it forward another 250 years, if I look at my role as an artist, it now trades on my own individual voice as coming from both a sanctioned and yet marginal position. And I also trade on the contradictory roles as either a creative genius, so-called, or a cultural laborer producing something of little use value. So this, this is, this, there's many ways to describe the role of the artist today, but those are some. So bearing these, these things in mind, I want to refer to a few excerpts from this, um, this brochure that I wrote on the, the specific works in the exhibition in order to, to give you a little bit of a, a picture of, of the way I was thinking about the Durers and Hogarths, and then I'll move on to talk a bit about my work. I'll have a drink. So I start with, um, with Durer, and the section in the, in the brochure um, that where I refer to Durer is called Durer's Voyagers. So four woodcuts attributed to Albert Durer are illustrations for Brandt's Ship of Fools or Nerenschiff, um, the first version of which appeared in 1494. The book shared intentions with other texts of the time where moral teaching was emphasized through overt references to the inevitable effects of immoral living. Images, both textual and pictorial, of human folly were presented as exemplars of the results of misguided behaviors and attitudes. Interest interestingly, the allegorical idea of a vessel loaded with careless people, with irresponsible and otherwise undesirable types, and we might imagine also physically and mentally disabled people, um, that image was not new in Brandt's time. In fact, conjecture exists as to whether the practice of la launching troublemakers aboard a real ship may have actually occurred in the area between Holland and Austria in the 14th century, um, the most famous of, of such uh, purported voyages being beginning in Aachen. Whether this is in fact true or not, whether this happened, it can definitely be said that by the time of Sebastian Brandt, um, it was determined to picture such a vessel for the means of social persuasion. So the ship of fools had become allegorized so that it was then understood as a potential bearer of all humanity. Nobody could escape the ship of fools. In view of the then commonly held moral imperative to live wisely or suffer the consequences of one's folly, it had become an image for the masses. And so the, um, the 112 images in the book really represent a whole range of, of situations that involve the fool or within which the fool's behavior is supposed to be kind of noted and disapproved of by the viewer. Um, the works in the collection here at McMaster produced by Durer share the narrative and pictorial tone of the total 120 or 112 pictures in the Nerenschiff the whole of which was produced by a group of five artists. And there's actually quite a lot of conjecture as to how many of the prints Durer actually had a hand in producing. Nobody really knows. There were actually, as I say, five engravers, artist engravers, who were responsible for the whole selection of the prints. Um, the titles of the prints that we have here give the flavor of Brandt's program. So one of them is Mocking of a Good Deed, the other is Of Hasty Tempers, the other is Of Old Fools, and the other is Of Taking Offense at But Learning from Fools. And clearly one of my interests in this last title was the idea that um, the, the foolish figure could be also a source of some sort of wisdom. Um, and this seemed to me to be a, an interesting kind of figure of the artist. Some questions exist, as I say, as to the extent of Durer's full involvement in the production of the prints. Um, I think I have time just for a minute to read you just briefly the passage from Brandt that um, the, the, the print of Taking Offense But Learning From Fools uh, is based on. Um, it's, I'll read some of it. Um, some of them are very long, very allegorical, and you would have a hard time kind of following the logic, but I'll give it a shot. Fools daily one may see who fall, yet ridicule them one and all, and scorning them make pretense wise, but earn a fool's cap, what a prize. One fool, another fool will goad, both traveling the selfsame road. But rocks that cause one fool to stumble will also make the other tumble. Full many a, a fool 
hyponymies, saw heedless, yet like unto these, he courted danger, risked his head, and but for luck, he had been dead. One blind man calls the other blind, yet both are of the stumbling kind. One crab will scold the other cause, he's walking backwards on his claws, yet none goes forward in reverse. They follow the other, which is worse. If you would be a stepchild rather, and not a son, then spurn your father. Uh, Phaethon had been more sh if Phaethon had been more shy, and Icarus, uh, when he, could, he would fly, had they but heard what father said, in tender years they'd not be dead. The way that Jeroboam went has never made a man content, yet others follow, knowing pain and grief are marching in the train. Who sees a fool that takes a tumble should be on guard lest he too stumble. He's not a fool in any season who criticized fools with reason. The fox eschewed the cave, though urged, from which no one had e'er emerged. So a good sort of, um, obviously, suggesting that fools recognize the fool, foolish behavior of other fools and at the same time can learn from them. Um, so I was interested in these marvelous small Durer prints for their significant lineage and also the fact that they capture the essence of a project for art, one that's now more than five, 500 years old, and that I consider might actually have some potential for renewal. And by that I don't mean to call for a conservative retreat for art, but rather for a willingness to question the terms according to which the modern project dismissed many of its precursors if that's not a singular thought. So I guess I'm suggesting that some of the job of art, even five years ago, might need to be reconsidered and I think is being reconsidered by artists. I'm now going to talk a little bit about the Hogarth works. So I want to turn to think about Hogarth whose approach was uh, becoming comparatively modernized while, uh, I'm sorry, his approach was becoming comparatively modernized in relation to what we see in the Durer prints. In this exhibition, a wide array of engravings by Hogarth, who lived from 1697 to 1764, and who was the most celebrated British engraver of the 18th century, are seen. They manifest a brand of narrative pictorial art aimed at social persuasion, a method quite unfamiliar to us in the contemporary context. At least the kind of directiveness is certainly, I think, unfamiliar. Um, Although I was thinking I'm actually involved in another exhibition elsewhere with the work of, and the, the artist Carol Conde and Carl Beveridge are going to be showing after me. And I was thinking about their work, which is very much kind of informed by um, the union movement and issues around labor. And it's absolutely and very, very much directing us to a certain way of thinking. And so it's not that this doesn't exist, but it's comparatively rare, I think, in, in modern and contemporary art. Um, in the Hogarth, which ranged between a series of works such as the Harlot's Progress, and there's four of, I think there's uh, eight in the whole series, um, maybe more. Um, they're shown over on that wall. And um, the images themselves involved the fictional Maul Hackabout was her fictional name, and then the actual Mother Needham, um, who was a figure in London. Um, the show also includes the work, work from the Rake's Progress, who which was the sort of counterpoint to the Harlot's Progress. Um, and these works indicate that figures of the day were depicted within extended narratives and the works often engaged viewers in what it seems to me must have been almost a reality TV-like system where social mores and the kind of the, the, um, the goings-on of, of, uh, of certain elites and, and lessers were, were depicted. I think these are, that's the job of these particular works by Hogarth. Other allegorical works, and many of them are over here, um, such as The Lottery and parodies like The Lecture, demonstrate that Hogarth's oeuvre provided a feast of visual commentary. The artist himself was a figure of renown in his time, and a glance across all of these prints uh, suggests that he was a maker of images who was filled with both humor and venom. So while he was apparently harboring a soulful interest in the well-being of society, he was certainly highly engaged in, in sending the society up as well. 
Hogarth's work don't, works don't generally betray a preoccupation with voyaging in the title of the show, obviously, and there's a, a kind of, um, you know, the allusion to this whole idea of a kind of a, a sea voyage. But there is um, a particular work that actually does refer to um, sea going. And it's a curious print over on the wall over there entitled Industry and Idleness, Plate 5, The Idle Prentice Turned Away and Sent to Sea from 1747. And this does kind of use, utilize the nautical world as a backdrop. One of a series of 12 images, the work is part of a narrative sequence that according to this same historian Mark Hallett, my friend, um, Hallett says it manipulates powerful stereotypes of commercial virtue and masculine fecklessness that clearly mediates the hopes and worries of an emergent bourgeoisie in the city. So meaning that effectively he was holding up the idea that, that the well-being of the bourgeoisie was also dependent on, on, the, um, on the, the failure in some sense of the downtrodden. In the image, which is part of what Hallett refers to as a pictorial conduct book or a graphic satire, we observe the fate of the slothful idol who um, is part of the plebeian culture to which more industrious types had become blind in England at the time. So here Hogarth portrays seagoing as an activity of apparent last resort for the rejected. A view, a view of the entire series, um, if we were to see all of this industry and idleness series, suggests that Hogarth thought that the virtues of the commercially successful ought themselves also to be subject to critical scrutiny and perhaps consequential measures. And Hallett also suggests that we can interpret the whole series, Industry and Idleness, in two rather different ways. On the one hand, as a pictorial conduct book that appropriated the themes of popular culture for bourgeois ends, or as a satiric series that consistently calls into question the values of commercial culture. So inevitably, the image emphasizes the idea that to be put out to sea is the fate of the unsuccessful and it's a heartless sentence that was meted out upon um, those in the community who, who basically couldn't cut it. Um, so I'm getting right near the end of this part on Hogarth and then I'm going to move on and talk about my own work just a little bit. Um, but I think it's important to note that the spectrum of graphic works by Hogarth in the exhibition powerfully conjures the social anxieties and political challenges of mid-18th century England during an area that was burdened internationally by the Seven Years' War. And the Seven Years' War took place from 1756 to 63. The war involved the majority of the world's powers at the time from throughout um, and saw Britain experience a crisis of stability to which Hogarth responded. The most urgent reference to that context uh, shown in this exhibition is a small print entitled The Times Plate One from 1762. And Hallett says that it offers an extended allegory of domestic faction and international crisis. The scene is a city representing Europe in the throes of the continuing Seven Years' War. And there's kind of a double-edged double capacity of Hogarth's images to function as socially inscribed allegories and also as kind of psychologically charged tableaus that speak to the way that the society was feeling. The print had the potential to engage the anxieties of the target audience to which it was being marketed, but still to be marketed to them. As Hallett notes, the print's urban consumers, even as they appreciated that the scene functioned and, as an allegory of Europe's devastation, would have also been keenly aware that it more immediately conjured up the horrific image of their own capital city, London, a place that at the time was eaten by fire, overrun by the mob, and ravaged by decay, etc., etc. So the Times, the print, deliberately tapped into the deepest anxieties of Hogarth's affluent consumers about their own city. And you can think of this, this kind of effective art today, I mean, think of somebody like Edward, Edward Bertinsky, whose representation, glorious representations of, of environmental decay and disaster are, as we can imagine, highly collectible um, by, by people who, who can afford to collect them. So this character of William Hogarth's program, its ability to offer those with the means to purchase images of a troubled world, both seductive and disturbing, bespeaks the remarkable, remarkable efficacy of the artist's work as a form of currency, at least for me. And in this case, I mean, it was a real currency for the collector of the time. His graphic depictions were made for consumption as cultural goods, for purchase by those who could afford them and their messages. 
So such works would have become private artifacts to be held on to and even ostensibly, we could say, domesticated. Yet surely they would not have become completely untroubling to their owners, given their chaotic scenes and their capacity to implicate those with social power as well as apparent power over the images themselves. And I remember one time uh, when one of our graduate students was being examined by um, Barbara Fisher, who's a curator, Barbara actually asked her about the idea of somebody buying her work and the idea of somebody actually buying her work's meaning. And I think that this is a, a really interesting kind of problem or it's a question for artists and certainly an artist like Hogarth was very interested in having his work collected and disseminated in all the ways that we see popular culture being uh, disseminated today and some, some contemporary art. But the idea of who owns the meaning, of course, is, is always um, open to discussion. Um, and, and I would suggest that probably often um, contemporary artists don't feel that they're necessarily selling the meaning even when they sell their work, but I might be wrong. So I end this excerpt with this note on the economic status of Hogarth's works, but certainly I think of them as participating in the kind of artistic exchange system that I've been attempting to envisage. So now without suggesting that we now have to kind of trade in the Hogarths for my works, I wanted to look a little bit at my project as another kind of artistic turn. At this point, and this is where I, I really need, do need to come clean, I think it's important for me to take off my curator's hat or my interpreter's hat and to reveal my artist's head um, to simply speak about what I did. And that's strategic because as an artist, I'm, I am interested in the idea of interpretation, but I think that I'm not necessarily solely responsible for interpreting my work. In fact, I think it's better if I don't. Otherwise, I wouldn't make the work. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about what I did. Um, and hopefully that will give you some opportunity for interpretation. But um, I, will, I will resist a certain amount of interpretation. Although I will say that there is a kind of a simple logic, which I myself tried to undermine. And that is that if the project, it follows like this, that if the project of, of being a graphic artist, which I'm calling these printmakers, project of being a graphic artist has involved a long lineage of, of critical engagement. Um, and if we take the ship of fools as a certain kind of paradigm of critique, and then we move through the Hogarths, obviously when we come to my work, I've made a series of shipwrecks or at least they, they initially were intended to be shipwrecked. So you could say that inferentially, I might be suggesting that I think that the critical project for the artist is a shipwreck, or maybe a failure, or it's doomed, etc. And some days I do think that actually. But more days I think of, of the way that artists work as, as really more of a kind of inversion, and yet still involved in the same project that people like Durer and Hogarth were committed to. And by that I mean that I think we live in a society where all kinds of commodity culture gives us very direct messages, even very direct messages that seem, um, seem kind of rife with goodness. So you can think of the Benetton ads we used to experience that seemed like they were so anti-environmental or, or anti-environmental problems, but they were still selling us t-shirts. So I think that artists really know that that it's, it's a very difficult project to actually say something in a direct fashion that will actually move people. Um, certainly, I think I as an artist wouldn't imagine the possibility of saying something in a direct way that could move people to action, but I could imagine saying something in some fashion that will move them to reflection and also to a change of mind, which is obviously the first step towards other kinds of changes. So th the work I decided to do then was to begin by, by making these kind of, um, I really started with these little studies of shipwrecks. And I had already been working on these kind of printed structures where I'm interested in, um, th th another series I was doing was based on water towers. And so I was interested in using a kind of a, a recognized architectural form and all of the, the kinds of um, associations that comes with it. But at the same time, in the models I'm making, and more particularly in the large pieces, I'm interested in embedding the material that the work is made with, or, or printed with, with language or information, not so much with messages. And so the small shipwrecks are 
stamped, rubber stamped, um, with references to really patterns that kind of refer to water and, and structures. And these really, in, in a sense, become the kind of the text of the work, and yet it's not a kind of legible text that basically has a, an overt message. So I began with those, those little pieces and then decided that I wanted to, um, I wanted to work them up. And I, I had a little bit of a, a struggle as to whether or not I wanted to work them up in a way that was going to be directly referential to the, works, the other works that I had chosen from the exhibition. But I decided to do that, although I did, I did it in a couple of ways. One of the things I did was to take some elements from some of the Hogarth works and to actually make small collages in which I included my own drawing. So in some ways they were, you know, they were, they were digressive and speculative drawings based on the Hogarths, in which some of the meanings I imagined were, were brought along with the kinds of literal information that you can kind of see in the images. And in other ways, the kinds of things I was doing, I think, was contradicting what Hogarth was representing. So I made these collages, and then I basically scanned them and had them printed on, um, so these are all digitally printed, this wood, other than what has been stained and, um, and also where I've used spray paint and stencils. The wood is all digitally printed and, and the, the boards are about two and a half inches wide. They're only about a quarter of an inch thick and I can print about six at a time. And once they're printed, then I do actually slice them down so that they become narrower and so that the information on them becomes even more, in some ways, lost or at least more embedded. And so then I begin in the same way that I do with the small models by really working on a, on a substrate. In this case, it's a thin kind of mill board. It's like an architect's cardboard. And basically, just piece by piece, I'm, I'm cutting the wood and gluing it, almost like making a puzzle or even somewhat like a mosaic. And as I do that again, I'm kind of breaking down the system even more. And I'm interested in that. I think not so much that I'm just trying to get away from meaning, but I'm interested in the idea that, that I could begin with a kind of a system or I could begin with something that's, that's, that's whole and take it apart and reassemble it in a way that I hope will be a bearer of meaning, but obviously a meaning that I can't be completely in control of. In some cases, you could see there was little bits of text which I've sanded away. The only text that I left, and it's a little bit cheesy maybe, um, but the word here, the times, and also there's a word taste here. And I left, especially the word taste I'm interested in, I mean the times almost becomes like a subtitle. And again, I, you know, it seems a little heavy handed, but I think the whole thing is so allegorical that giving people a little bit of a pointer of some sort is not a bad thing to do. But I, I left the word taste there because I think that as, an art, as artists we have this kind of inheritance of aesthetics that suggests that Within aesthetic language is the possibility that artists could actually say something that would be good for society or, or would make a kind of a, a statement that would actually kind of in, in compel people in ways that would form them as, as good citizens. And I think that we, um, in contemporary life, we no longer have a system like that that, that we actually think that we, we may adhere to as if, as if the system works. In fact, I think the system doesn't work because it's been so taken up by capitalism. So oftentimes we actually need to resist aesthetics or we, we need to resist certain aesthetic systems in favor of actually saying something that will actually have an effect on people. But at the same time, as an artist, I still know that my job is to be an artist, so I'm still interested in having some, some engagement or control over for example, the tool of, of art making, and one of them is, I think, aesthetic practice. So that's my little sort of soapbox, but um, that was the reason for leaving in that word. Um, I won't say too much more about these other than that the original images for these shipwrecks were from the internet, where else, but uh, there was an image of, of the bounty that went down. It was a replica of the bounty that went down when Hurricane Sandy happened a couple of years ago. So you, there are these kind of contemporary images that seem like they're really kind of loaded with, with significance on a number of registers. Even the fact that, you know, we're still making these, these ship replicas. There's this huge kind of romanticism, I think, associated with, with ships. Um, Finally, the last thing I, I want to just comment on 
when I was writing my proposal and thinking about how I wanted to proceed, I think I was very conscious of this idea that maybe I was saying that it's all a shipwreck. And so I wanted to have some company on the voyage, and so I invited um, some artists to be stowaways. And I really was very open about the idea that I just wanted them to give me an artifact or an object that had some significance for them, maybe significance to their work specifically, but maybe even just significance to their life. So you could say that implicitly I was asking them to participate on this ship of fools, and I guess I was in the sense that I really do think that in the best sense what artists do is it's foolish um, and, and it's a, there's a kind of necessary foolishness that I, I really do subscribe to and I think that you know the job of, of a museum like this is so significant because I think that oftentimes what the foolish things artists do end up being fascinating to collectors because they, they see them as so kind of perverse and often they're quite beautiful. But I think a museum like this can also make it possible to look at the foolish things that artists do and see them for their complexity and not just for their collectability. Now hopefully the, you know, we also make things that are collectible that can be shown in museums like this. But I, I do feel really quite committed to the, the necessity of, of the museum as a place where, where we can consider the, the work of artists in, in, um, in the ways that I'm describing. So I know I've said way too much and um, it's 20 after. Um, so if people have to leave, they could leave. But uh, if anybody has questions, um, I could try them. So thank you. <laughs>